Hello everyone and welcome to the third module of this section that we are dealing with in considering culture as a language. We have already taken a look at it as a kind of a form as well as a structure. Now we will come to a completely different angle of approaching language as a sign and finally look at the possibility of expanding it to understand culture through some Indian classical texts dealing with the philosophy of language. As I already said towards the end of the previous module that we are going to largely devote ourselves towards the Naya Darshana Prasthana and uh, some of the texts that I will be uh, taking into account include Tarka Bhasha by Keshava Mitra and we will also take a look at uh, Shabda Chandra Prakashika by Jagadish Bhattacharya and we will have the very important and seminal Tarka Sangraha by Annam Bhatta and of course uh, Vat Science Naya Sutra. Uh, so these are some of the texts along with a few more references here and there that we will be using in understanding language as a kind of uh, science system. And what is the take on it by some classical Indian philosophers? As I already said, that we will be generally navigating through uh, certain milestones, certain, certain milestones, certain landmarks in uh, this philosophical direction, because uh, exploring the totality of it will be quite out of the question in this brief span of time. And if possible, finally, we will take a look at poetic language. Now, as we all know, that the general uh, the two first important terms that we have from where we can actually begin our departure in understanding are sub shabda and earth. Uh, now, shabda can mean a sound, it can also mean a word, and we will not really go into more uh, yoga darshana kind of it. We will treat it as a sign, we will treat it as a sound image. And artha in Yai can have different meanings. It, it is one of the pramaya categories that we have. But here we will largely use artha as both sense meaning. How do we mean what it has to mean? We will start from here and then we will develop it into a sign. So we will start with the very basic categories of word and meaning. And then uh, not all words are signs according to uh, Indian philosophy and uh, we will find out that what really qualifies as a sign. So I will be sharing a screen with you. Yes. Right. So now this is it. This is what we have. Now what we what it generally says in the beginning is that the Shabda and the Artha are connected to each other through an element of Smriti. So there is a memory element in it. Whenever we utter a Shabda, we are reminded of its Artha. And whenever we have an Artha in mind, it reminds us of a Shabda. There is no independent existence of the Shabda and the Earth. Shabda and the Earth, they go in, they go hand in hand. They form a structure. So they are bound to each other. We cannot really give any primacy to one over the other. We cannot say that the Earth predates the Shabda. The Earth is something that was already there and then we name it. The moment the earth is there through 
the relationship that it has with the Shabda, the Shabda is immediately reminded of. It invokes the Shabda. Through this Smriti, it becomes a smaraka of the earth, as you can see. That Shabda becomes the smaraka of the earth, and earth becomes the smaraka of the Shabda. And there is a rule that governs it, and this rule is called this function, this memory function that is carried out is called vritti. It's called vritti. Vritti, vritti we know in a rasa theory, vritti has a completely different meaning. But when we come to the linguistic philosophy, the semiotic part of Indian philosophy, particularly through the uh, uh, philosophical position, vritti is the memory function between the shabda and the earth. And what is that relationship? It is, said, it is said over here, it is written over here, you can say, it is Eka Sambaddi Gyanam Apara Sambandhi Smaragam. So the knowledge of one leads to the memory of the other. The knowledge of one invokes the Smriti of the memory of the other. But this function, the Vritti Sambandha, the Vritti function that we have, it can be divided again into two types. So let's come over here. Now, vritti can be divided into two parts. Two wills or two itcha. It's called two itcha, two wills. That is there. One is asmat padat ayamartha bodhvaya and the other is idam padam Amumartam vodhatu. One means let this particular earth emerge from this Shabda. May this particular meaning emerge from this word. And the other is may this word have this meaning. May this word has this meaning. We generally say this word means that. The word in self cannot really mean anything. We are already uh, imposing a kind of a will on the word. Even if we take the word as the subject and say that, for example, that the word pen means this particular thing. Uh, the word cannot mean. Nyaya does not place the itcha on the word. It says that there are two forms in which this will is carried out. One is that may this particular meaning come out of this word, eat the asmat padat from this word, ayamartha, this particular meaning, bodhyaya, be understood. And idam padam, may this word, amumartham vodhatu, mean this, mean so and so. And these two itcha, are called Sanketa, which is literally the sign. So the sign in Nyaya philosophy is this will that connects its two parts, the Pada and the Padartha. A Pada, when it is empowered by this particular will, when Shabda is empowered by the will, any of these two itchas, it becomes a pada. So pada is a shabda that has the will to mean something. And <clears throat> these two ichas, these two ichas, the wills that we have, is the sanketa, is the sign. So sign here is the will that binds the pada and the padartha together. Not very, not very different from the Sasurian sign, which is. Uh, which is, which is again the structure that binds the signifier with the signified, but those signifiers will come in a different way. We will come to that. But the sanketa, sanketa, is the element, the will element that binds the pada with the padartha. Now sanketa again can be of two different types. Sanketa can be of two different types. And this is where it becomes a little uh, uh, dense. 
One is what is called the Nitya Samantha, which is also known as Shakti Samantha. And then we have the Adhunika, Adhunika Samantha. Nitya Samantha would mean that the Pada and the Padartha cannot be changed. They are bound in a relationship naturally. It's not arbitrary. Nitya Samantha. Both the Naya Darshan schools, the old schools which we called Prachin Naya, and the later school which is known as Navya Naya, both of them believe in the Nitya Samantha of the Pada and the Padartha. The Shakti Samantha of the Pada and the Padartha they cannot be changed. They are in essence bound together. Because the will, according to Prachin Naya, is Ishwaricha, it is the divine will. That has put a particular sign, that has put a particular Pada in connection to its Padartha, and that cannot be changed. Navyana simply calls it an Icha, it does not call it an Ishwaricha, but it does accept that there is a will that goes behind the Pada and the Padartha bound together. Adhunika, the Adhunika school of Sanketa, when we consider it as an Adhunika Sanketa, it does not believe in Nitya Samantha. It believes that the Pada and the Padartha are bound by an arbitrary structure. However, if there is no will, if there is no Nitya Samantha, then we cannot really call it a Pada as well. It is a Paribhasha. So when we call this a pen and we do not believe in any kind of Nitya Samantha existing between the word pen and this particular object that I'm holding in hand, then the word pen is simply a Paribhasha of the object that I held in my hand. It simply stood in its place, anything else can stand for it. Then it's called the Paribhasha. So depending on what kind of Sanketa we consider words Pada and Padartha to be together, the sign and the, uh, the signifier and the signified to be together, we have different names as well. When we believe in Sati Sambandha, then the signifier is the Pada and the signified is the Padartha. One is the Avidheya Dhayaka and the other is the Avidheya. And if we consider Adhunika Sambandha, then we have already seen it is called the Paribhasha and the Paribhasha. Uh, the Sasaurian semiotics that we are largely familiar with is actually a presentation of the Adhunik part, the Adhunika part of the uh, philosophy of language. Now, there is a large degree of controversy regarding this arbitrariness of language, and I have already said that this needs to be settled down. Exactly what is meant by arbitrariness uh, is sometimes misunderstood. We have to remember that uh, Naya Darshan is largely a Nastika Darshan. That is, it believes Veda to be a testimony. And it also believes that Shabda and Artha, Pada, Padartha, Sammandha, the Vritti Sammandha, cannot really be arbitrary. Although that is the Adhunika Mata, that is the, that is the Adhunika way of looking at things, of considering it to be arbitrary, but it is not really so. There is something deeper than that. There, there is an Itta Sammandha, and it is a proof for that. Uh, as you can understand that Naya Darshana was often attacked 
lament uh, by the Buddhist linguists and also to China linguists in a completely somewhat different way that Nitya Sambandha does not exist between the Pada and the Padartha. And they had to counter it. And they had to counter it. Uh, it was not uh, as uh, somewhat uh, say, basic as saying that no, Nitya Sambandha cannot exist because then how were words changing from one language to another? So, but it was a kind of more uh, subtle, it was a more nuanced attack on Nitya Sambandha that we had. So let us see how exactly this uh, Naya Darshan accounted this claim and established Nitya Sambandha because it will be important in understanding the philosophy of poetic language where this Nitya Sambandha will be reposited. And what exactly do we mean by Nitya Sambandha also needs to be understood and clarified. So if we challenge the Nayaikas and we tell them that Nitya Sambandha cannot exist, because when I call this the pen, in a different language, we can use a different signifier. So there is no natural, there is no eternal, there is no essential Sambandha between the signifier pen and the object that I'm holding in my hand. Uh, then the, the Naya Darsha Darshaniks, the, the Nayaiks, would actually take this argument and put it against me in stating that that itself is a proof of Nitya Sambandha because Naya Darshana believes in four kinds of pramanas, four kinds of epistemes through which we know knowledge is gathered through four kinds of ways. One is through protection by actually looking at things. One is through upamana, as you can see, through analogy. One is through anumana, which is through inference. Now, if we consider how we know this to be a pen, then uh, philosophy would take me, this is not protection. By looking at this particular object, the word pen does not come to my mind. Therefore, it is not prataksha pramana. It is not upamana. I don't know this by analogy. It is not anuman. I don't know it by any kind of inference. I cannot look at a pen and infer that this is a pen. Or I cannot, if I am not familiar with a particular language, just listening to the word pen will not remind me. So the linguistic sign, so the linguistic knowledge, the padartha, is being carried out in a completely different form altogether. It has completely a separate pramana. And therefore, that is not arbitrary. Uh, Nitya Samandha is not Pratyaksha Pramana. When the Nayayak is saying that the Pad and the Padartha beings uh, bears a kind of uh, vritti which is uh, guided by a Nitya Samandha Sanketa then it is not saying that had it been Nitya Samandha, we would have just taken a look at the pen and knew it to be the pen. Now that is not it is saying, it's saying something else. First it is saying that Shabda Pramana is therefore Vilakshana. It has a completely different uh, symptom, completely different form of knowing than Pratyakshadi Pramana. They don't share the same signs, they don't share the same Lakshanas. It is known by something else, which is called pratiti. So there is a new uh, word that is being introduced here by the grammarians whom the Nayaiks follow. Uh, and Nayaiks follow the grammarians and the grammarian also follow the Naya system in some particular way. And uh, therefore, the way we know Shabda is through the pratiti. Pratiti of the boat. Now, what is pratiti? Right. Uh, pratiti is semantic, understanding of meaning. And it says that it occurs not through a sign itself, but its relationship with other signs which are in its proximity, which is called Sannikarsha Sambandha. So when I am used the words, using the word Likhani, for example, or pen, for example, Two syllables are coming together, and this 
act of coming together is creating a structure which is known as anvay. Anvay. Now, anvay is the structure, the bringing together of syllables joined through the sandhi rule. And in a sentence, it is the structure that is guiding the chronological placement of words. So Anvaya is actually the structure that is bringing phonemes in the case of a Shabda and words in the case of a Vakya together. And along with Anvaya, we have its counterpart, which is Vyati Reka, which means signs which are not used. Phonemes which are not used, just as Jacobson was saying, that it is always made by a binary of presence and absence. Similarly, it's, it's on a very similar line that the grammarians are arguing. And uh, Jacobson was actually very closely familiar with the work of the classical Sanskrit grammarians. And he often referred to them, uh, often not getting into that kind of a very hair-splitting uh, analysis of word formation. But his concept of binary, apart from having its root in the prog linguistic thinking, also had a strong influence of, of the Sanskrit grammarians whom he mentions. He also mentions the medieval linguists. Uh, he mentions Augustine a lot. But what I'm trying to say is that this binary reappears over here in the form of an Anvaya Vyati Reka. So what the Naya philosophers are telling us that the word in itself does not mean anything. But when particular phonemes come together, then the act of the coming together leads to signification. So the meaning is not in the individual word. The meaning is not in the constituent phoneme. And when we take larger units like a sentence, the meaning is not in the individual shabda in the individual pada, but it is in the padas which are being placed close to each other in sannikarsha with each other, then there is a relationship that is being created between the two, which is sannikarsha sammantha. And this sannikarsha sammantha is guided by the rule of the anvaya, the structure, and vyati reka, the difference, which is giving rise to meaning. So the meaning of a word, signification, if we can call it, Shabda Bodha, which is also known as Anvaya Bodha, is what emerges through the structure of Padas connected to each other through a rule or a structure which is not arbitrary and therefore there is a Nitta Samantha. We cannot really again go back to referentiality. It is not referentiality that is being referred to here. Nitya Sambandha does not mean the object pen that I'm phenomenally holding in my hand and the signifier of pen that I'm saying when I'm uttering this particular word. It says that between the signifier pen, the padam, and the meaning of the pen, there is a Nitya Sambandha. It has nothing to do with this uh, physical thing that I'm doing, that referentiality does not lead to meaning. Uh, where is the meaning then? There is slightly difference between the thinking of the Mimamsakas and the Nayayakas. Naya Mimamsa are related uh, to different philosophical schools of Indian Astika Darshanas, but they're closely related to each other. And according to Mimamsas, Mimamsakas, the meaning is manifest through the meaning-making capacity of the word. So the word pen in itself has the shakti. Shakti has to be understood as the element of nitya sambandha, which can invoke a particular meaning. The Nayaika says that the pada itself cannot mean anything. It is apadartha. Uh, in Bengali, we often use the word apadartha in uh, denoting a useless person. right? So the pada itself is a useless person. It, it's, it's an apadartha. But what it means is that it does not have a meaning in itself. The Pada in itself does not have a meaning. It cannot mean anything by itself. It derives its meaning only through its value, which is 
here termed as samsarga maryada the value that is derived through its structural relationship with other padas samsarga coming together maryada value so the value that is derived from its relationship with other padas around it is the samsarga maryada and this relationship this relationship through which samsarga maryada is derived is called akanksha so a pada has to be sakanksha it has to have an akanksha it has to have a meaningful samsarga maryada which it is deriving from its relationship with the other padas around it which gives its meaning which is where the meaning resides so this is largely the theory of meaning according to the indian uh, semantic the semiotic tradition right. now we will move from here slightly towards understanding poetic meaning where what is the poetic meaning then and thus if we have to then speak about poetic language what we have to understand is that when this meaning making structure is transferred to poetic language then what the aestheticians are saying is that what we mean by artha is something that is only there in poetic language everything else is avidhya we can uh, just go back to the quote from uh, abhinav gupta abhinav bharati when he is speaking this is patra vakta rase eti adharanaksha pradhan vachya kavyasha artha rasa that all other kind of meanings padartha as we have said vakyartha the vakya bodha eva paryavashyate everything turns into rasa it is among all these meanings the main meaning is the kavyartha arthante pradhanyate iti artha so only that is that we will call artha which is the poetic meaning that will come out of it natu artha sabadoti adhi adhyaya vachi so we will not take the avidhyaya artha we will not take the vacha artha the poetic meaning is the kavya artha that is the main arthante pradhanyana iti artha that is the main meaning of that is the only meaning that we have so poetic words creates its own meaning it is a closed circuit this this meaning the poetic meaning that is created is completely different from non poetic usage of language so meaning when for example when i'm speaking to you which is definitely not poetry you are understanding it through either avidhyaya artha if you accept nitya sambandha if not it's paribhasha but when you read a poetry by a poet you actually get to the earth which is not avidhyaya which is its own end how is it achieved is something now we will go back to lotman we have already spoken about lotman and we will come to an end through this uh, lotman says that in that jacobson circuit that we studied we have the addresser and the addressee finally coming to the poetic function lotman qualifies it by saying poetic meaning appears when the addressee and the addresser collapses 
when the addressee comes to the addresser and both become one when the i she communication turns into i i communication that is when poetic meaning emerges there has to be an element of self referentiality and it is this self referentiality vis-a-vis -vis the external referentiality that gives poetry its own unique language defamiliarization occurs through the collapsing of the addresser of the addressee leading to the kavyartha as different from the avidhyartha and then lotman goes to stay, say that the entire cultural sphere the semiosphere of culture has to be understood in this way where both auto communication which is the i i communication and the natural communication which is the i she communication are deployed simultaneously this is the language of culture i will just draw a conclusion here it's difficult to conclude something which has so many different strands uh, moving in different ways um, but i hope that uh, whatever I said will be of some benefit in some way to your studies, to your research. Please give me feedback. I am just developing this communication, uh, interactive intercultural communication uh, theoretical premise. Uh, yeah, it's still in a nascent stage. So your feedback and your suggestions, your questions, your refutations, uh, uh, your whatever feedback you have here, you're most welcome. Uh, and thank you very much for bearing with me for such a long time. And I conclude by again thanking Ramanujan College, uh, the principal, the IQAC, the Department of English, and all other teachers and my colleagues who are here, my friends and colleagues, for uh, sharing so much time with me.